The best sporting moment of 2018 belongs to Aussie legend Kurt Fernley. Please, a round of applause. Thank you. Congratulations. You're getting used to this. <laughs> Let, let's start and go back to that Gold Coast Marathon because you knew going into it that it was your last official race in, in the green and gold. For that reason, did it feel different? Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, the whole games felt different uh, the, from the, the moment that I flew out of Newcastle and uh, everything just stays the same in Newcastle, you know? Like you walk down the street, <laughs> It's, it's seeing the same people every day and uh, then I landed in the games and the first time I went into the village and a volunteer broke down and started crying in front of me and I just look and go, you all right? <laughs> and they said, I just never thought I'd meet you and then it just escalated and I just kept telling myself that, uh, that this, is, uh, this is such a rare, rare thing that an athlete finishes on this moment. Just go out, bury yourself for it for them and, uh, and, and know that you've got no more run at it. And, you know, like, I, like, like John said about the green and gold, you, you do own it just for a bit and, and you carry it, you do sweat in it, and you want to make sure that that last time that you do it, you wring it out. And I wrung it out. <laughs> I, I, I was busted. <laughs> Kurt, I'm really interested. We hear all the time that successful athletes are as strong mentally as they are Physically, do, do you wake up in the morning and feel like there's nothing you can't do? Uh, it, honestly, sometimes I wake up in the morning and, and, and wonder how I make it through the day ahead of me. You, you wake up in the morning and you doubt whether or not you can, you can take the stage, the, the, the biggest stage, whether you can know yourself. And, you know, leading into the games, we, we had a six-month-old girl in the house, and you think it's hard trying to train for a marathon when you're 23, getting eight hours of sleep. Try doing it with a, with a six-month-old who requires no sleep. Um, <laughs> but my wife, uh, my wife Sheridan, she, she, she's one of the ones, you know, that your family just carry you for so long. Um, and those six months leading into those games were one of the hardest times, I, I would say, both of our lives, because you know, like you're putting everything you can into that racing and you wake up every morning and you try and convince yourself that you can do it and you fight against any single doubt that you have so that you make sure when you get to that line, you know, the battle's won and you're convinced that you can win this one particular thing. But, you know, if you are that athlete, that fortunate athlete out there that wakes up knowing that they're going to win every single morning, then great, you know, amazing. Run with it as long as you can. But if you're the athlete that wakes up and doubts, push against it and work with it and convince yourself that you, you can get through those doubts. And that's, that's part of sport and that's the beauty of sport, that you, you battle on the field, but the battles that take place off the field, are the, you know, they sometimes are the hardest and, and most meaningful. Can you tell us what it meant to you, the expectations heading in and then what the reality of, of it was to have the events for athletes with disability be fully integrated into the Gold Coast program because it really was so groundbreaking. Look, we've been there, we've been in the games for nearly three decades now. Uh, 1990 we were there. Um, and that's where you have to really, you have to give it to uh, one, Goldock, um, uh, two, the CGA, uh, Craig and your team, uh, the way that you, you really just, um, we were one team at these games. Um, Steve Monaghetti, mate, I'd go to battle for you. I feel like uh, you're the chef de mission. Um, chef de mission for the last three, uh, three comms games. Uh, but something's changing in our, in our community. And, and, and the, the Australian community are, are wanting to hear those stories of, of, of Paralympic athletes. And to my, to my teammates, and, and I mean my, my able-bodied teammates, the, some of this sharing times with uh, the bird uh, and, and the, the, the rugby girls and the hockeroos and the kookaburras, like they were my teammates there. And, and to, to guys, the, the para sport guys, Madison De Rosario, seeing, uh, seeing Evan O'Hanlon win, seeing uh, uh, Isis Holt, 17-year-old Isis Holt win gold, cerebral palsy in the 100. Um, the thing about inclusion, if you nail it, 
if you really nail it, sometimes that person who is the recipient of that gets the biggest stage of all. Mm. And this year, when, when Monas whispered to me that when he asked whether or not I'd, uh, I'd carry that flag into the closing ceremony, that's, that's when I just sat back and thought, shit, we nailed it. You know, like we did it. That, that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a four-year-old kid at home who's, who's going to be hearing about the guy carrying the, the flag into the closing ceremony in a wheelchair. And, and again, like, something was special in those games. And it was because people bought in, they owned it, and, and at every level really tried to progress it. And I also have to, uh, to shout out the, the, the 60 years worth of Paralympians that have fought and struggled in the shadows. Mm. And, and, you know, I, I, I benefit from the life that, that they created for me. And, you know, Uncle Kevin Coombs, he should be a name in every single household through the country. And uh, he's, he's somebody who I, I treasure to be a part of his family. And there are hundreds of stories that have been saying the same thing that I've been saying, just we haven't been willing to hear them yet, so. <laughs> Gee, I can turn a, I can turn a 30 second question into a bloody oral thesis, can't I? <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble because we're running so late. My last one for you. Since the Commonwealth Games, you have been on this life-changing, almost, lap of honour around Australia. You've just been named New South Wales Australian of the Year. Are you prepared for how busy you might be after January 26 next year, and can you train for that? <laughs> I'm terrified a little. <laughs> uh, look, I, I think that as a family, we spoke about the, op the, the, the opportunity that if I am named, I think it's about 7 o'clock on the 25th, and you get to... Uh, Look, you get to talk about some real meaningful stuff, uh, mm. and and if I am named, I'll do everything I can to to shake the place in a in a good way. Um, uh, there are there are things that we can do, and I, I always say I'm a true believer in sport. I love it. Changed my world, changed the way that I saw myself when I was seeing myself as somebody who was who was well. All my my family were were growing bigger, even, and all my community were growing bigger. I was uh, I wasn't. <laughs> and, and, then I, uh, and then I saw sport and I saw other people with disabilities and the first time I really, I really found my family there and, and it's given me this platform and if, I, if I'm given the platform on Australia Day for that year I'll talk about how, how sport has the ability to change our community, it has the ability to build leaders within our community and uh, also, that, also that hopefully we can learn lessons from what we got in the Commonwealth Games that we need employment, <laughs> you know, that's the one thing that we need. So I'll be shaking every single commercial setting, making sure that we employ more people with disabilities because that's the thing that will change our country for the good and change it forever. And it will just be impossible to turn around. That's the meaningful legacy uh, that if I am able to win those games, or win, those, or win that award or whatever <laughs> the thing is, that's the thing that I'll be singing about and uh, we'll see what happens.